Hello friends, welcome to my series on the neurotransmitter GABA. Last time we talked about some elements that are important to understanding the physiology of GABA in the nervous system. We talked about how GABA is synthesized from the enzyme or with the enzyme glutamate decarboxylase, which is also called GAD, G-A-D. Then we talked about how GABA is moved within or outside the synaptic cleft, uh, first by vesicular amino acid transporter VIAT put into the synaptic cleft and is taken out of the synaptic cleft by the GABA transporters that's GAT1 to 3 and then BGT1. And so that's what we learned last time. This time I want to talk to you guys about the receptors that are found on neurons and on other places for the neurotransmitter GABA. Receptors are, um, are uh, physiological constructions that can recognize and account for a neurotransmitter as if it's a, a, a key into a lock that then transform the behavior of a cell according to the receipt of that signal from the neurotransmitter. So for GABA, there are actually three kinds of receptors. They're classed into categories. The first one is called the GABA-A receptors. Those are the ones that you guys are most familiar with. The second group are the GABA-B, and not only you guys, but everybody else. The second one are the GABA-B receptors, and the third one used to be called the GABA-C receptors, but they're now called the GABA-RO receptors. RO being, well, we'll get into that in a second. So there's A, B, and C. I want to tell you guys in this video a very little bit about each of them, so that you guys get an, a top-down view of how GABA, the GABA system works in the body. Before, in future videos, we discuss specific topics, uh, in relation to GABA, as well as specific drugs or uh, phytochemicals or foods that affect GABA transmission. So today let's talk about these receptors briefly. To begin, uh, and by the way guys, I've taken notes from my notes, so you know, to make these things easier for you guys, I have my own notes and then I have, I have to write down you know, summaries here so I don't get too long-winded. But So basically, there's A, B, and C receptor classes. The funny thing is the A and C receptor classes share a structural similarity. So they're usually put on one side. The A and C receptor classes are called ligand gated ion channels. They're a kind of receptor class. What are similar to those? The nicotinic cholinergic receptors, the glycine receptors, or one group of the serotonin receptors, 5-HT3. So those are uh, ligand gated ionotropic receptors. The B receptors are metabotropic receptors, similar to glutamate's receptors in structure. I know this is a little bit boring and not that interesting, but I wanted to make that dis uh, distinguish that. So let's begin with the A receptors, and I'm going to give you guys some outlines so you under uh, get to understand them. First of all, the A receptors have many kind of subunits. So there's a GABA A receptor, but that receptor is actually um, it's a receptor made out of various kinds of subunits coded by individual genes in humans. So in fact, there are actually 19 total genes for the GABA-A receptors. And those genes code for uh, subunits like the alpha subunits, of which there are three, the beta subunits of which there are three, uh, sorry, the alpha subunits of which there are six, beta units of which there are three, gamma units, which is like a Y, a Greek letter for Y, there, of which there are three, there are delta units, theta units, and pi units. So there's a different ki different kinds of units. What happens is that, so these units gather together in as little as three units or as high as six units, but usually they gather together in exactly five units. So they're called pentameters or pentameters. So what these do, and they gather around the ion channel of the receptor. So the receptor will have like a hole and on the sides there will be the receptor subtypes all joined together. So probably I should, eh, anyway. I probably should include a picture of that, but whatever, I'm a bit lazy. So, they gather together in that way. They can be hetero-ologomeric, and they can be uh, hetero-pentameter specifically, where there are five uh, subunits of different kinds. So there are, so far, uh, researchers have found 25 assortments of these 19 genes in functional receptors in humans. But they tend to have certain kinds of configurations. And this is a little bit important. You'll realize why in a later episode. But for example, postsynaptically, what does postsynaptic mean? Two neurons communicating. One neuron sends the neurotransmitter to the other one. That other one is postsynaptic. The one who sends the neurotransmitter is presynaptic. So postsynaptically, the GABA-A receptors, which are made out of all these subunits, tend to be of three, for example, particular groups. One has an alpha-1-beta 
uh, sorry, alpha 1, beta, gamma 2, another is a alpha 2, beta, gamma 2, another is an alpha 3, beta, gamma 2. As you can notice, the one that's changing most and the most common receptor subunits is the alpha. So the alpha 1, 2, and 3 are very common in postsynaptic neurons. Whereas in extrasynaptic uh, area, what, did, what is the extrasynaptic area? It means these two neurons are communicating to each other. Well, right outside the neurons, when the GABA transporter takes out GABA, it ends up in this extracellular space. So in that area, there can also be receptors. So these extrasynaptic receptors for the GABA-A receptors tend to be alpha-4, beta, delta subunits or alpha-5, beta, gamma-2 subunits. So what you're noticing here is that the alpha-4 and the alpha-5 tend to be in the extracellular space, whereas the alpha-1, 2, and 3 tend to be in the postsynaptic neuron. This is quite important, and we're going to talk a lot more about this in the future. And this is really, it's very, very important. So, the, uh, the presynaptic or the postsynaptic neurons are activated only when synaptic transmission occurs, when a communication is, uh, is occurring. But the ex extrasynaptic uh, receptors are always activated, depending on how much GABA is in the brain. So this is something important to, uh, to remember. Now we talk about, I'm skipping around a little bit just because the, the GABA-C receptors are actually ionotropic, just like the GABA-A receptors. So let's start with them before we go to B. And they're not that important. So the GABA-C receptors, which are now called the GABA-RO receptors, that's with an R-H-O, and they're written like a pi, it's a P, it's a, it's a Greek P. So the GABA-RO receptors, first of all, there are two human GABA-RO receptors discovered. Uh, that is, the, they're called the P1 or Rho1 and Rho2. There is a Rho3 in other mammals, but it has not been discovered in humans. These GABA-C or GABA-Rho receptors, they gather together in homo or hetero oligomeric uh, groupings. Uh, they are five times more sensitive to GABA than the GABA-A receptors. And when, they're, uh, when their receptors are activated by GABA, they stay open far longer and they desensitize far less quickly to GABA. Uh, which is one of the most notorious things about the GABA-A receptors. So the GABA-C receptors don't really share this. Um, they also are insensitive to the GABA-A and GABA-B molecules. What does that mean? Well, whenever people, neuroscientists, are studying a receptor in the brain, they, uh, they select what are called like the standard agonists of that receptor. For those that don't know, an agonist is a, something, a molecule, that fits and binds into a receptor activates the receptor and causes a response element from the receptor. That's an agonist. An antagonist is something that binds to the receptor and prevents a response element from coming out. An inverse agonist, for example, is something that binds to the receptor and causes the opposite response element as an agonist from coming out. So usually with receptors in the brain, the agonist and the antagonist are a standard, like there's a standard definition of what they are. So, um, I mean, I, I can't think of any, right? Well, for example, for the GABA-B receptors, baclofen is the standard agonist. For the GABA-A receptors, the... Well, I don't know what the standard agonist is for the GABA-A receptors, honestly. But anyway, the point is, there's a standard chemical that is an agonist or an antagonist for these molecules. Usually, it will be the one that's, that's most selective for that, uh, for that receptor. So, GABA-A and GABA-B receptor antagonists and agonists don't affect the GABA-RO receptor or C receptor. Uh, now, mainly the GABA C or Rho receptors are known to be involved in vision, specifically in the eyes, but they actually, the recent research in the last 10 years has been showing they do more than that, but it's not very well understood yet. So what is known, for example, is that they're found in the amygdala, which is the fight or flight center of the brain and the part of the brain most responsible for anxiety conditions. So they're found there and they may play a role in anxiety. They're also found in the hippocampus, which is the place the brain stores long-term memories. So they may be involved also in memory formation or storage. Their, their antagonism, there are antagonists of the GABA-RO receptors, their antagonism increases wakefulness, decreases REM sleep, and decreases non-REM sleep in rodents. Finally, polymorphisms in the two human genes, genes for the GABA-RO receptor, which are called the GABRR1 and GR, GABRR2. RR is GABA Rho Receptor 1. So that those two polymorphisms and those genes are statistically significantly associated with alcohol dependence, with creatinine levels, so they may govern, for example, kidney health, and with hematopoiesis, which is the creation of new red blood cells in the blood. So fi oh, finally, let's talk about the GABA B receptors, which are the metapotropic receptors, which are some of the receptors that I learned the most about when I was doing this series. 
So these receptors are located presynaptically as well as postsynaptically. Presynaptically, they function as autoreceptors, which means they sense GABA because the presynaptic neuron is about to release GABA. So if, it's, if the receptor is on the presynaptic neuron, it senses, oh, we have a lot of GABA, and it acts as a negative feedback mechanism to tell that receptor not to transmit as much GABA. So it can be an, that's what an autoreceptor is. For example, the serotonin 5-HT1A receptors are also autoreceptors. They do the same thing. So the GABA-B receptors can do that, but they can do that for GABA. They can also do that for other kinds of neurotransmitters. So the GABA-B receptors have been found to uh, oligo uh, oligomerize or basically join together with other kinds of neurotransmitter receptors. And if they join together with, for example, a serotonin receptor presynaptically, they can inhibit serotonin release. So it depends on what kind of receptor they have and whether that, I mean, what kind of other receptor they have and whether that neurotransmitter for that receptor is excitatory or, neuro or uh, inhibitory. Because, so they can affect our um, mind state and our, you know, outlook in different ways depending on which neurotransmitters they're joined with presynaptically. As, uh, so, yeah, and they're also found postsynaptically or extrasynaptically specifically in the extracellular space in the brain. They have subunits, they have the, uh, they have the GABA B1, A, and B, and they have the GABA B2 receptors. Um, both of the B, both the B1 and B2 have to be uh, have to be a, a, in the same uh, like a grouping of receptors for the receptor to function. It cannot just be a B1 or a B2. So that's a little overview of them. Now I realize when you heard this, it's probably a lot of information all of a sudden, and probably won't remember that much about it. The most important things to remember is the GABA A receptors are very important. The GABA B receptors are very important. The GABA C receptors are less well understood and we don't really know much about them. They're not very useful for cognitive enhancement in 2020. Maybe in the future we'll know more about them. The GABA A receptors are very sen are not very sensitive to GABA and they uh, downregulate or uh, desensitize quickly in response to GABA. The GABA B receptors and the GABA-A receptors are mostly found postsynaptically. The GABA-B receptors can be found presynaptically as well as in the extracellular space, which the GABA-A receptors can also be in the extracellular space. And, uh, and they function a little bit differently, but we're going to get into more of, that, of the details about that in the future episodes. So for the rest of the episodes, we're mainly going to be talking about how to improve or how signaling at the GABA-A and GABA-B receptors affects our cognition, performance, well-being, and so on. So thank you guys so much for bearing with me. I look forward to speaking to you on the next episode tomorrow.